Okay, so we're on the E26 exam, super recent, 2022. Um, although I almost thought it was 2023, but I digress. And basically, we're going to go over this natural science passage. I'm going to scroll down here. Okay, so Carl Zimmer. Now, before before we start, um, what I want to say about the natural science passage is I was watching a video the other day, and they said a lot of the a lot of the answers are just basic kind of facts about that are like stated in the passage. Like, so look out for details, highlight the details. Another thing is the question stems can often be answered on logic alone, or at least it should make sense to you like rationally um, after you've tried solving it. All right, with that being said, let's just kind of like do a whole passage dissection here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this and I'm going to ask you to kind of translate in your own language and we'll kind of go back and forth so it's not all you. So here we go. Scientists have long puzzled over the enormous size of the human brain. It's seven times larger than we would predict for the mammal of our size. So it's super big. Many extra neurons in, um, are in a region of our brain called the frontal cortex where most of the sophisticated things take place. Okay, all we got here is basically humans, big brain. Um, sometimes I like to take notes on the side. I just say human, big brain, frontal cortex thinking. All right, now I'm going to read this and I'll ask you to do the same thing. To understand how we ended up with such a strange organ, many scientists have turned our uh, to our fellow primates. They have large brains, although not as large as our own. And it turns out that the primates with the big prefrontal cortex and live in large groups. Okay, uh, summarize this really briefly. Um, for research, scientists use primates um, and then just found out that a big frontal cortex is for like larger groups. Yeah, large group uh, primates and, and then predict the future. That's another important thing. So maybe from that, you can predict that humans have some form of social intelligence, as it says here. Okay, let's keep going. A boost in social intelligence can lead to an evolutionary edge of primates. Well... Connected female baboons, for example, dominate their bands. They have more babies than low-ranking females, and their babies enjoy better health and faster growth. Okay, yes, so we have a biological explanation for that sociality. Next, brain imaging studies have revealed that when people think about people, parts of the prefrontal cortex become active. Okay, that's the sophisticated thinking part. Um, advocates of the social brain hypothesis say that the frontal cortex expanded in our ancestors because of natural selection favored social intelligence. Okay, what is that one saying? Um, just saying that frontal cortex expands a lot when we Yeah, it's, it's kind of like... Uh, Offering more of that kind of hypothesis. And there's this interesting thing too, is like people watching people with the frontal, which is a big part of what it said in paragraph one. That's why we got the frontal part. Cool. Most of the research on social brain hypothesis is focused on primates. One reason for the bias, says this dude from this university, is many scientists thought that no animals were worth studying. Primatologists have argued for years that primates are unique in terms of complexity in their social lives. Okay, so there's some bias here. That's what I'm gonna write. Bias and, and then Dr. Hoke, whole camp. <laughs> All right, next. From her experience with hyenas, Dr. Holkamp had her doubts. She began to run experiments and that spotted hyenas um, on spotted hyenas, similar to the ones around primates, and she would play recordings of hyenas, for example, to see if the other hyenas recognized them individually. They did. Soon they came to see that, that the primates only view of the social brain was deeply flawed. All right, summarize this one really briefly. Oh, this is talking about like experimentation on hyenas. Uh, they yeah. There's so much primates. And what they conclude? Um, oh yeah, they conclude that they could like recognize um, yeah, the hyenas can can kind of recognize other hyenas. And who's uh, who does this support? Whose theory? Uh, Whole camps, right? It's her research, so it supports her. It supports her theory, and it goes against the primatologists. Goes against the primatologists. Okay, so categorizing in your head, like who's saying what, who said what, is super important for these types of things. Next, I'd argue that it's not true at all. Spotted hyenas live in a society just as large and complex as baboons, says this person. Noted, same person. Noted that the spotted hyenas live in large sets of groups of any carnivore. We're talking nearly 60 to 80 individuals who all know each other individually. Okay, so more evidence, I would argue, more evidence for Holkamp's position, but this time it's just like a justification, maybe, explanation. Next, to understand social intelligence of hyenas, the same person and our colleague tracked them from birth to death. The work begins in the communals where the cubs live for the first couple months, and then the old spotted hyenas pay regular visits in the dens, giving the cubs opportunity to learn the rigid hierarchy. Spotted hyena societies have one dominant female on top and a series of hyenas below her. Can we make a comparison? I think we can. Remember how I said one on top? That's the same as the female um, baboon from earlier. All right, each cub learns exactly where it fits in the hierarchy and where all the other spotted hyena fits as well. Okay, so a lot of social learning and that uh, is basically observational kind of learning that whole camp did with her colleagues. Next, hierarchy reveals itself most vividly when it's time to eat. Nom nom. When the two hyenas make a kill, other people in the plan join them and fight over them, but the dominant female always wins. Okay, so there's some sort of seeding in the hierarchy. Just, just going quickly here. There are times, however, when an entire group of hyenas comes together. Spotted hyena clams, clans patrol the borders of the territory together, and then the whole territory is on the line. Uh, when all that happens on the line, then these unrelated individuals join forces and join a clan war. Okay, so there's some huge kind of like whenever we have um, battles of territory, then there becomes some great kind of communication and like homogenization, which probably implies social learning on the part of the hyena. Okay, I'm gonna read this one. I'll ask you to kind of synthesize this one now. 
All right. What makes this social complexity of spotted hyenas, particularly enlightening, Dr. Holcomb said, are the relatives. They belong to a family of four species, and the other three that live strikingly different societies. Holcamp wonders if this strange, oh, if this range of social environments arrangements is reflected in the structure of the hyena variants. Okay, what does this one say? He's just saying that spotted hyenas are like other family. Yeah, basically it's got a big old family, four other ones, and maybe the brains are are different. Yeah. Next. From CT to hyena school, it's possible to reconstruct the three-dimensional image of the brain. Holcamp and our colleagues have been working to, to make uh, to survey dozens of skulls from all four species of the hyena family species. Their preliminary results indicate that the hyenas follow the same rules as primates. Okay, so that goes against the primatologists. Next, it's just uh, what the social complexity hypothesis would predict. The hyenas would, with the simplest social systems, have the tiniest prefrontal cortexes. The spotted hyena, uh, which lives in the most complex societies, has far and has far away the largest frontal cortex. And then we have John Silk, who loves monkeys, and he goes to Los Angeles. And he's like, yo, I love this research, directly relevant to understanding the origins of social complexity and intelligence. Okay, so then we have John Silk, who loves Dr. Holcamp's argument. Dr. Holcamp goes against the primatologist. And of course, our intro is just some uh, information about the prefrontal cortex. Okay, is that uh, fair? Anything we missed out there? Uh, no. Okay, that was a pretty solid overview. And we were going slowly, right, doing some definitions and, and what have you. And still, we found time to kind of like blaze through that passage. So uh, which... Question, would you like to go over? Um, 32. All right, so let's do 32. The author cites brain imaging studies in the fifth paragraph, primarily to support the point that what? Okay, the brain imaging studies in this paragraph. Do we remember what those were talking about already? Uh, I don't really. Let's go back. Brain imaging studies have revealed that when people think about other people, parts of the prefrontal cortex come active. Okay, so basically what we're doing here is we're trying to say there's a relationship between the prefrontal cortex and social behavior. Um, so let's see. A. Oh, sorry. F. The frontal cortex is at the center of social intelligence. Hmm, is that true? Yeah, that seems right. It seems like that's what it's trying to do. G, most of the human's extra neurons are located in the frontal cortex. Is that the purpose? Is the purpose just to make that... Wait, no, no, no. Does it support this idea? Does, does it even say that the extra neurons are located in prefrontal cortex? Maybe, but even so, this thing about brain imaging isn't measuring that particularly. All it's doing is trying to draw a link between the frontal cortex and social intelligence. So G is too too much. It's like, it's too specific in a wrong way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, I don't know if you've seen Star Wars, but there's this part where Anakin tells Padme, you're going down a path I can't follow. Oh, wait, no, Padme tells that to Anakin. And uh, yeah, so the ACT is the same way. It, it, it'll take you down paths you can't follow by being really weird and specific. Um, and once again, your job is to be a cold calculating, you know, disqualifier who was just throwing this out, out because like most of the neurons are located in the frontal cortex. First of all, I don't even remember hearing that. Second of all, that's not what the point's being. Okay, H. Majority of research on the social brain is focused on primates. No. The purpose there was to talk about how the prefrontal cortex is the hub of social intelligence. So H is taken in a, in a weird way too. J. It's uh, possible to reconstruct the third dimension of, of this through a CT scan at school. That's way later. That's way later. Come on. Come on. Give me something harder than that. All right. F. <laughs> so that means it's going to be F. I, I, wanna, I was referring to J. Yeah. So F is the correct answer there. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm curious. Which one were you between? Um, did you Were you choosing between like G and F? Yeah, it was those two. Yeah. Um, did it mention extra neurons at all? No. These extra neurons, I, I didn't. I don't think it mentions them, right? All it's saying is people. People think about people. Frontal cortex lights up. I don't see a lot about that extra neuron stuff. Yeah, this is all about the people having social intelligence and where that's located. So F is a better answer than G. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Feeling good about that? What's the next one? Um, thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. Okay. According to the passage. When does the spotted hyena first learn its place in the hierarchy? Remember when it was a cub while living in the communal den? B. That's in uh, the top right of the passage, I think. Let me check. Here it is. Bloop. They work in communal dens with the cub live for a couple months. Done. Answered. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, sometimes it's easy to miss those things. So the, the advantage of doing it like we did is we encoded hardcore. What do I mean by encoding? I mean, everything we read, we made sense of it in our head. Like I tried to form a picture in my head of, of little baby cubs, you know, growing up in a cave and going like, Ooh, mama, you know? Uh, and then, and then the mom coming out on top, like uh, super dominant, you know? And then afterwards, you know, the four groups of hyenas, like it's all visually right there in my head, you know? Uh, and it, I can't tell you, it helps. They, they could ask, you know, any question like about like the fruit trees or whatever. And I'd be like, okay, that's in the first part. Like uh, I remember is right here, patchy sources of fruit trees. You know, they could literally ask anything and I know immediately where to go to double check my answer really quickly, but I don't even have to really go back if I, if you just kind of know it, you know, like communal den. Um, and that's how, you know, that that's how, you know, to quote the enchanted, that's how, you know, yeah, you just have to, uh, really encode the heck out of it in your mind, translate it. Like you're kind of talking to a 10 year old kid. 
that's uh I don't know. That's kind of a really good skill to have as, as a reader is just, you know, so it just goes in one year or, or through the eyes and I don't even know where it leaves, but um, we just don't pay attention. Otherwise we like finish the whole thing. Like, Oh, what did I even read that just, see, that just says you're not predicting the future. You're not like engaging with the text. You're not pretending you're a hyena, you know, pretend that you're a, you're Dr. Hope, whatever <laughs> poker <laughs> and her colleagues pretend that you're a primatologist. How are you feeling now? Pretty slighted because your worldview is wrong, you know? All right. All right. Um, Hopefully that was helpful uh, to just kind of run through the passage and clarify it. Did you feel like these questions were easier because you got more time to read it? Or do you think it was just the reasoning between the answer questions that was the, the most difficult aspect? I Are think you... it was but for the... Yeah. Um... Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, I was about to say they're not, they're not like they're mutually exclusive, but um, I guess I was asking like, when you read it, oh, like, did your aha moments come when we were able to slowly dissect the passage or were they more from, you know, like just reasoning between answer choices? I think for 32, nine. Do you say for 42, for 32, it was like reasoning and then the other one was just like where it is in the passage? No, it was like the opposite. Oh, the opposite. Yeah. Okay, okay. Hey, fair. Um, so what I suspect then is maybe just work on that encoding just a little bit more. Do some predicting. Um, you, you told me you hadn't taken a break, even a slight break, like five to 10 minutes between. So you're probably jaded at this point. Time's running out. You could care less about the hyena den and their clan. But I'll tell you, you know, one, <laughs> you can't miss a single point. Uh, you know, you're trying to get scores that are better than the average scores at Harvard. And I'll tell you, you know, you, you got to be on your A game. Like at the very last minute is where the points get made, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and don't, don't, hopefully, sorry, hopefully it's not like anxiety inducing. Uh, the point is you can do it. You've already got a 36 in this and every other section. You're, you're a complete genius. You're fully capable of doing it. No doubts at all. Um, I just want to animate you and, and kind of get, get that energy there. And I, I think you're going to be a okay. All right. Any other questions here in the passages one, two, and three? Uh, kind of a little slow burn on some of them. Do you have a Do you have a passage that was maybe a little 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 tough? Uh, not really. It was just um two other questions. Yeah, which one? Uh, it was from passage two. It was fourteen and 16. fourteen and sixteen. Okay, let's go ahead and dissect this one. Um, but what I'm going to do is I really want to try to retrain your brain in in terms of reading and try to encode like everything. So just for the sake of it, just for fun, this time, what we're going to try is I want every single and every single sentence that you read, make an image in your head, just, just for fun. I just want to see how this feels for you and see how much kind of time it takes. We'll do this kind of relatively slow, slowly, but I really do want you to go through the process of, of doing that. Um, and I'll do it too. Are you ready? Does that sound good? Okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. And we'll, we'll just kind of test your reading comprehension and, and see if it's approved. If it's not, hey, we'll scrap it. But yeah, here we go. So uh, history of money and Jack. Of the great civilizations that flourish and withered and ancient wherever this place is, Anatolia. The Lydian does not rank among the best known. Okay, what does this mean? What do you think? Um, not as well known, I guess. Like yeah, uh, we haven't said much. I, I envision a bunch of like cities, tons of them in this, in Anatolia, wherever that is. I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm so bad at geography, apparently. But tons of cities in An Anatolia. And then I see like Lydians and nobody cares about them. That's a, so in my head, try to try to imagine that really try to visualize it. Okay. Lydians formed a small kingdom in the, in the seventh century BC. Okay. So I'm like, Oh, it's super old, but at its height, the Lydian kingdom was a little more than overgrown uh, city states. Okay. So it was super old, but it's like spread out. So not very dense. I'm imagine. And it's like near, near Sardis. Cool. So I'm, I'm envisioning all this and it doesn't take a lot of time to do it. Lydian Kings were not celebrated in Mithra song as great warriors, conquerors, or even lovers. What were they then? See asking question. Only one name of the ancient Lydia is commonly known today. Croesus. Croesus. Okay, so I guess this is a king. Nobody remembers the kings. Apparently they were just like Homer Simpson sitting on the couch, but then we had Croesus come along. What is he going to do? I don't know. He sent it to the throne here, so like what? 200 years before it's, it's whatever. Um, yeah, it was a 200 years. 7th century, yeah. Two, so it's like a 150 before the kingdoms. So maybe he established it. Alright, to rule that was already rich. Oh, it was already rich. Okay, so he's sitting on, he's sitting on piles of throne. Uh, piles of, of money. All right, his ancestors had made a, first, a firm economic basis of the kingdom of wealth by manufacturing some of the best perfumes and cosmetics around the world. Okay, so he's sitting around wealth and he's also got a bunch of perfumes. Yet these goods alone cannot have uh, raised Croesus to the level of wealth that the myth accords him. Okay, so it was aggrandized through, through legend. For that, he depended on another, on another invention. Coins, yay. Okay, so now we finally get to what this is going to talk about. Prediction, I think they're going to talk about coins. Okay, so I see a guy, a guy Croesus, sitting on a pile of wealth and his thrones and it's 560 BC. And it's like 100 years away before like the zenith of uh, Lydia. And I see like nobody remembers any of the other kings. But I remember the Croesus was like legendary. And what else? Um, 
Yeah, and there are pl- tons of places and cities near them, but nobody really remembers Lydia, but everybody's probably going to remember Coin. Okay, so all of that is like really, it's immediately accessible here. Why? Because I made a, a ludicrous like image in my head of it. All right, how's the envisioning going? Is this kind of helping? Are you able to make these these visions? Are you able to kind of encode it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, what I now what we'll do is let's just try to read this sentence by sentence in terms of direct comprehension. So I'll read the first one and I'm not even going to read it like this. I'm only going to translate it. Like I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to, my eyes are going to move and I'm going to, I'm going to read it, but out, out when I speak it, it's just going to be my translation of it. That is proof of my encoding. So here we go. Um, So they changed the money in Mesopotamia, but apparently they didn't transition fully to coins until this date. So until like 80 years after this dude, they didn't fully transition. Next. So why was he super smart? Well, basically he figured out, he figured out that basically we needed these transportable things to represent work. And basically he figured out a big problem was he had to standardize them. And so he he just kind of put his stamp on it and then that made his economy boom. So feel free to read like that. Um, well, the point I want to get across is I don't care how quickly you read. I don't care what happens. All I care about is that you're encoding and it means something to you, you know? Every sentence is drenched with meaning. Okay. Give this a shot yourself. Um, this first sentence. Go ahead, give it, give your best shot, and don't feel pressured to go quickly. Just at your pace. What would this? What would? What is this saying? You made a coin out of electrum. Yeah. Well, what is electrum? Did you know that word? I actually didn't know that word. What is that? Is that a common word? Just, you can just tell me. <laughs> I probably just don't even know. No. Okay. I had, I had no clue what electrum was. So instead of electrum, I might just say, "Hey, the coins were made of like a little bit of gold, but also silver. Cool." Um, they made that kind of combination you know, oval slug several times thicker. Than mine. Okay, so what is this saying? Um, talking about like size, how it's like one spot and then like a bit bigger than the water. Yeah, yeah. They made it into a big old chongus. So it, it gets all like big and thick like the modern coin. Nice. To ensure their authenticity, authenticity, the king had one stamped the emblem as a lion's head. Okay, that's the thing they talked about here. So drawing connections, that's just as good as like saying what it means, probably. The stamping um, also fl- flattened the lumps, beginning the transition from the oval number to the circle. Okay, so this is the transformations that were made. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to go quickly now through this, uh, but I hope I hope going through that process like highlights exactly what we're looking for when we're really understanding these things. Okay, so nuggets, same weight, same size. King elim- eliminated its super time-consuming thing. Hey, let's not weigh this anymore. And now we can just evaluate it based on the, the, the stamp. So the standardization makes it so you don't have to waste money scaling these things. Do it, and uh, you can immediately know the worth of all these things. And the use of coins uh, it now may- means that we can do things more honestly as well. So if you don't have a scale, you don't have to trust other people's scale. You trust the government. Commerce funds up in new dimensions of the population. And then Croesus is just going to be booming in wealth. It's like crypto but of the 50, 560. Croesus saw new coins appear gold and silver rather than Electrum. Okay, so then, then they just make them out of gold. And this is even more standardized. And then they can trade for the daily necessities in terms of these coins. Awesome. Variety of abundance led to another innovation. Okay, now we got a market because it's probably more easy because even a stranger had something to sell the market they can with the coins. Merchants specialize in goods. Somebody can sell meats, all sorts of different things. Musical instruments even aren't excluded. And then um, the market system is coming, spreads to the Greek, medieval markets in Northern Europe, and the suburban markets in the contemporary United States. That's actually super dope. I had no clue this started in 640. I am so happy I took this practice test. Come on, please give me print out another one right after this. I, I want to take more. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but maybe. All right. With the conquest of Lydia by Cyrus, the reign of Croesus ended and the Lydian kingdom disappeared from the pages of history. It's gone. I did not expect that to happen. So basically, yeah, dang. Cyrus just took over. And this impact is small, relatively known kingdom has a big old impact in the, um, oh, disproportionate to its size. So basically it's a small place, but had big impact. Okay, that was quick. Like you could literally read it just like I read it there. And as you can, as you can tell, like we're trying to translate the heck out of this. Um, And I, I feel good. I, I feel like I know exactly where things are in this passage. You know, ask me about the hybridization of Electrum. I know where to go. It's like right here, you know, ask me about the markets. I know I'm going to move right up here, you know? So like, I know exactly where everything is. And we read it quickly. Like, you probably could have just read at that pace. Um, so with that being said, what question would you like to go over? Um, 14. 14? Yeah. Okay. The author most likely uses the overgrown city state in order to do what? So do you remember this without having to go back? In the beginning. Yeah, it's in the beginning and it says where to go for five, six. I, I honestly, I don't want to chance it. So I'm just going to go back. At the height, Lydian kingdom is a little more, little more than overgrown city state. Okay. So he's trying to say that it's maybe small, and but it's like, what? Populated? Let me see. Emphasis in the importance of Lydia. What do you think? Is he trying to say it's important? Eh, no. 
the whole point of this passage is that Lydia is like kind of tiny. Um, indicate a rapid growth of Sardis over again, city of Sardis. No, they're talking about Lydia. And no, we're not trying to emphasize that. At this point in the passage, they're trying to talk about how it's an itty bitty little place. It's called Lydia. You wouldn't know of it on a map. That's basically, remember, par- paragraph one is like, hey, you probably never heard of Lydia. Super small, right? So they're trying to say it's tiny. Probably. I think H is right. Uh, J, identify the government structure of Lydia. No, that doesn't say anything about the government structure of Lydia, right? So is the answer H? It's got to be H. Yeah. Okay. Another thing too, the main idea, there, there are a couple main ideas. One is that Lydia's, uh, one is that like coin, where coins were created, you know, Croesus's role in creating coins, the standardization of coins, the introduction of markets, you know, uh, the revolutionizing of the economic world from the 600 BC. That's like, that's a thing. The other part of this passage is that Lydia is small. I saw like two driving forces there and the answers to, if they align with the theme and main idea, that's, that's good. That's a big, that's a big uh, clue that it's the right answer. Hey, is there another one you missed or is that it? Uh, there was also six. Uh, 16. Okay. Accords most nearly means, okay, this one's not comprehension. 15. Yeah. These goods alone cannot have raised the level of wealth that the myth accounts accords him. So let's take out this word that the myth says that he did. That's, that, that's like, so try, try to fill it in with your own words. You know, I try to fill in with my Blakeism. There it's like says that he did or or uh, a lot to him or like, yeah, to, um, it's written about him. How about that? Okay, so F confines. No, no, not it doesn't confine at all. Um, assigns mm, that, the, that the legends assigned to him. I guess I could see that working. I don't love it, but it technically seems like it's correct. I um, we'll keep going though. Owes to no, the, it doesn't owe him anything. It, the legend is just saying that he did something, so it's kind of like assigning him. Yeah, um, measures him. No, it doesn't measure him. I don't even know what that would mean. So H and J are wrong. Uh, F is wrong. J, G is seems like it's it's the best choice there. Okay. Uh, could you just double check that? Did I get that one right? Yeah. I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Um, is there another one until twenty? Uh, no, that's it. That's it. All right. Hey, uh, I always like. <laughs> I pause when I when I teach the reading. A, a while back ago, I was actually creating an ACT curriculum with some of the brightest tutors that I've ever met. We all pull, like we pulled together. I did. I wrote the English section and the math parts of it, and then these guys wrote the other sections. And I was like, guys, I have no clue how to teach the reading section. Um, and this was like last year. And um, the reason why I kind of felt that way is because it's like you just you're teaching somebody how to read, and so there's something like. <laughs> Not like pedantic about that, but there's something like it's difficult to kind of teach somebody the whole process of reading comprehension. But then I was also thinking, okay, the biggest tips I can give then are are like the timing tips, how to skim through this, get the points you need. Because think about how dang well we understand this passage. Like you and I right now understand that hyena passage, like the back of our hand. We understand the coin passage so well, but like, look at these questions complete softballs. Like you don't even have to understand the passage to answer them. And so like, sometimes you don't even need this thorough understanding. That's why I tell people it's a balance. You know, you got to get in the passage and get out of there because it's only point oriented, you know? And so what I used to do is I used to literally go like this. I I would skim 13 to 20. Like I'd go, okay, innovations, overgrown, okay. um, Electrum. And then I'd go to the passage and I'd look for overgrown electrum innovation. And then as soon as I could get the answers out, then I'd be done. And I, and my, my hack was like this. I'd go to the natural science section, especially because that one's all about facts and details. And I would literally try to like answer the question. Like I would try to answer it as I answer the questions as I, as I read it. Uh, and it worked for me. But the thing is just today, I was also working with another student who we tried that and he got a 27. And then we tried just reading it methodically and slowly you got a 34. I, I don't even know. <laughs> you know. So it's just like these people, it's whatever strategy works for you, but it's always like this hybrid approach that's appropriate for your type of strategy. But the under underlying Socratic kind of encoding methods are always the same. All right. That's my rant. That's my rant. Um, <laughs> but basically the turbulence that you see in this score, it's normal. You know, the best way to make sure you get a good score consistently is to be consistent in your approach. And that means encoding everything. That's the best thing I could say, either encode everything or maybe just try your best to like get move more quickly through the passage and passage map a little bit better. It's like a whole bunch of skills that we're kind of honing in at once. Have you ever owned a pair of Chacos? Yeah. <laughs> you know how you have to like pull the first and the second and the third at the same time? It's like, you have to get somebody a pack rat to do it because it's impossible to do it yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, when you're doing the reading comprehension, you got all these skills going at once. But if you do it together, then it fit, then it then it it's smooth and it's a good product. All right, that was probably like a stupid analogy, but <laughs> but that's how I feel about the reading. All right, any questions about the reading or any other way that I could help? Uh, Are there uh, any more questions? I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Um, let's hit some science then. What was the first uh, science question? Science, I think, 22. 22. Okay. Suppose six drops of methyl violets are added to the aqueous solution of acid. I had a professor at Harvard. I always thought it was aqueous, but my professor, I don't know if he was just a Boston accent, but he always say ache, and now I've caught on to it. I don't like it, but okay. This watery solution of acid with a pH of this and this. Based on the results of experiment two and three, the color would be what? Okay. Oh, oh sorry. You said 22, and I just did 24. I just love that the question. Okay, a student predicted that the formic, the formic acid solution, the acidic and acidic acid solutions have the same acid concentration by mass and are both constant here. The formic acid has a greater surface tension than does this one. The results of which experiments um, support or refute. Okay, formic has greater surface tension. Let's uh, let's unpack this. Um, experiment one's results better support this prediction. Experiment one's results refute. Okay, formic acid. All right, so I actually haven't looked at the passage yet, so let's do that. <laughs> uh, here's our experiment one. Looks like we got five nitric, five formic. That's good. We got we got acetic as well. And uh, so we have our acids in question. Each five solutions have different uh, percent mass of acid. Oh, hey, and they're measuring surface tension. Okay, so it's definitely going to be figure one. Did you get that far? Or experiment? Yeah. Sorry, not figure one. Yeah. So it's experiment one. And now let's see which one has greater surface tension. What was it asking? Formic versus acetic. Uh, formic has greater surface tension. Is that true? Formic is this this dot here, and then acetic is this this one right here. And it looks like it's consistently higher now. Seventy three, six. Yeah, like they're always higher for formic. And so does that refute it or support it? It supports it, right? So formic acid is yeah greater surface tension, and that that's true. That's a true statement. And experiment one tells us it's true. So I think it's us. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what went wrong there? You think when you're answering it? I think I got part where it was like on experiment one but i just couldn't tell if it supported or oh did you see this claim though that it was saying basically when it says support it's saying it's it's like greater and if it's refuting then it says it's lesser so it says greater so it's f okay yeah okay so maybe getting that one right in the future would entail like a, maybe a closer reading of the question stem i don't know yeah maybe? okay uh what's the next question um 29 sweet new passage for all the studies performed as described, which of the following criteria must have been satisfied for any given trial? Huh. Maybe this is a question about independent and dependent variables. Let's see. Well, I have to understand this uh, this passage, so let's take a look. Apparently, you got a beam that deflects, and we're measuring the deflection of the beams. Okay. And we separate it by distance L and D. And here we change the L, here we change the L. And we see how the bend responds because D is probably the bend. Let me check that though. Yeah, the deflection of the beam is measured. And then here's the apparatus. Okay, so let's talk briefly about the scientific method. Scientific method is super dope. What was that? Francis, Ro wait, no, is it Roger Bacon? I can't remember who mentioned the scientific method. But why is the scientific method so powerful? The, the reason it's so powerful is because you isolate variables. That way, at the end of the day, a good scientific experiment means that it's conclusive A causes B. Like that's the purpose of science to figure out exactly what's causing what isolate those variables. And so do you agree this, this, this experiment would, would kind of go to crap if this beam were like differently set up each time, right? Uh -huh. Like, like, let's say that instead of putting it upright, they put it like this for one of the experiments. Would that change the D value and everything? Uh -huh. Yeah, it would totally just throw off the experiment. And basically, I don't know if that's going to be what they're asking for. But it's going to be something like that, right? They're going to say it's going to be some obvious thing that you're taking for granted in the experiment. That would really just throw off the whole groove if it were changed. So 29, which of the long criteria must be satisfied? Let's see. The beam has to be perfectly rigid. Well, if it's perfectly rigid, it's probably not going to bend a lot, right? So yeah. I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I like perfectly rigid means that we probably would eliminate the dependent variable that we're looking for. So A is not good. B, the supports must have been fixed in position. Okay. If you change the position, would that change the outcome? Maybe. Like if you change the position of the supports, then would that change the outcome of the deflection? I think the answer is yes, well, because... Like if you put it super close here to this to the bending point, then you'd see less D, right? And then experiment two, you run it and it's like this far away. And then in experiment three, you run it this far away. You have to isolate those variables. So B, what it's saying is, hey, um, which of the following must be satisfied? Basically, it's saying we have to isolate that variable and fix it in position. Is that true? I would say yes, because otherwise the experiment doesn't work. Yeah, so this is like the big thing we're taking for granted. But if you changed it, it would, it would make the whole thing blow up or like it wouldn't work. C, the applied force must have been less than the weight of the beam. Why? I don't know. That's just a random rule, um, which is what I say at SeaWorld when people tell me that I can't. Anyways, <laughs> D, the maximum deflection must have been measured uh, prior to applying the force. What do you think about that one? Um, uh, just, yeah, yeah, I know. I don't see anything specifying that. No reason for that. Basically, it's something that you're going to be taking for granted here. B. Okay. Cool beans? Yeah. All right. What's the next question? 
Um, I think those two are the only ones that I still needed help with. Sweet. That's sick. Nice review here. Um, geez, it seems like those were kind of like, uh, maybe, maybe on the easy side, if you would have just, uh, maybe just, maybe just focus or something. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like all the other ones without looking at the answers and I got those right, but for these, I still couldn't get it. So I don't oh. know. Oh, gotcha. Maybe they are kind of com like confusing. Twenty nine. Uh, there, if you notice this, this occurs like once at least in every science section. Probably not twice, just once. And it's all about isolating variables. So just be on the lookout for that. Because I remember back in the day when I was prepping for the science. Although I've told you, I didn't prep for the science. Like there's a reason I didn't. I got a thirty five instead of thirty six. Right. Like I did not do a good job in the science section. I sucked it up big time. But the little that I did study for the science section back in the day, um, I hated these questions because I always thought they were so subjective. But in reality, no, it, it's just, okay, this one would screw things up. These ones aren't specified, you know? And then the other one is just a really confusing kind of question. But you basically have to read the question stem in detail and just say that formic greater than surface is the status quo and F supports it. All right, well, are you ready to move on to the next test? Oh, uh, should we hit the, let's just really quickly, I, I just wanna make sure there are no grammar questions in the English. I know there are only like one, there's only like one in the email. Yeah. Or do you feel, do you feel good about it? I think the one that I got wrong, it was just like a misplacement of a comma. Okay, just a comma misplacement. You don't want me to kind of uh, go over it at all? Is it good? I think it's fine, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Let's do this uh, next test then. 2022 ACT here. Oh, and you got, did you get a perfect score in the math? Did you even miss any? For this one? Uh, was it the other one that you got a perfect score on? Uh, no, for, for the E26 one. E26, I think I might have missed one or two. No. But you understood them afterwards? Okay. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this guy here. Barcode's a linear history. Oh my gosh. I went over this test with somebody else today. But I can't remember. It was a different form, though. Was it Z04? Yeah. Hey, this test is actually the same as Z04. Did you know that? Oh. I knew I recognized this. I knew I recognized it. <laughs> yeah, this is this is straight up Z04 from 2000, I think, 21. So huh, the ACT literally just, just said this is a new test, but then, like, released it a year later. <laughs> Savage. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's do this thing. What do we got for our... Uh, oh, your scores. So here we go. I'm going to... Um, in this and I'm actually just gonna if you don't mind I'm actually gonna open up the answer key in this one just to make sure I have it if, if that's cool with you okay yeah um for the reading just because I, I, I need to give you uh some of these tasks I haven't read blind leading the blind here okay um let me just pull this up okay pull this over here okay um let's get started so what was the first uh tough spot on the reading fast um I think the first passage first passage how many did you miss the first pass? First one, I missed it because I like, missed five in a row. Uh, you missed five in a row? Well, it was like two, three, and then seven, nine, ten. Two, three, and five. seven, nine, ten. Okay, let's just kind of dissect this one. It's going to be worth slowing down. Um, but first, give me give me your overview of A and B. Just give me give me the rundown. I, I don't know if you could. Uh, I just can't hear you. Oh. There you okay, go. Wait. I'll go a little bit closer. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Oh. Oh, okay. So for passage A, this other guy that the main, like the narrator met and was talking about how that guy was uh, having this attitude of like how people treated their pianos and like kind of like connected that to his philosophy. And then he was talking about like um, pianos aren't just like a piece of furniture. And then for passage B, um, it first starts off with like two artists who like sold their instrument when they retired and then uh, they kind of connected it to their own life and was saying like how important like their violin was and um how like their violin is their friend yeah with retirement different ways nice okay i hear you um sounds good sounds good let's just do a brief dissection I i'm sure that, that that's a very nice recap um so let's see even when luke was busy he couldn't uh he and could not talk he always made welcome and allowed me to wander in the inner sanctum of the back room. Moment. Okay, so he's a nice guy. Things get quiet. He seemed glad the company would tell him about the pianos that had just arrived. He seemed glad of the company. Oh, so he's he's happy. Go like he's happy just talking about the pianos. Um, our talks made real for me one of the fundamental beliefs that each and every piano had different. So, like you said, had its own personality. Nice. That, so you got it right there. Um, sometimes he knew all the details. He talked to the owners and all this stuff, and intricately knew how how it was created. Other times. He knew nothing beyond what he could just see and feel in here. Most pianos came through auctions and charity sales, and they didn't know the histories. But even then, he could figure out the histories. Whether the piano had been played very much, little, very little, the environments, the humidity, um, one of his cardinal roles, so that's his job. Whether there had been children there, 
And if it had been transported by a ship, the worst thing you could do for piano, he said. And at these moments, he's part detective, part archaeologist, part social critic. Okay. His attitude about how people treated the piano sent a mirror philosophy in his life. While regretting uh, depredations worked by children on keyboards and, str and strings, he regarded them as tolerable because the piano was at least used and said it's at the heart of the family. Okay, so maybe he's French. I don't know, or whatever this is. Uh, it was more than just, oh, you would know that. It, it was more, right? Wait, do you, do you speak French? We? Oui? No. Oh, no. Okay. No, pa. All right. It was uh, more than just any piece of furniture, but it was that too. And if uh, drinks were spilled and stains were on the finishes, it was the price one paid for imitating the young of joy. I like this guy. He seems like a super happy grandpa. He's happy when people play his pianos. He loves the pianos. Those who preserved the pianos and the altar of the art of music was worshipped, irritated, uh, Luke, but he was deeply respectful of serious musicians who use independent of the instruments for their livelihood. So he doesn't like it if you just leave it up to profit. He wants it to be used. Now let's look at these next dudes. Mark, one of the greatest oboists, told me that after retiring the performer, he sold his oboe. On the face of it, giving up. Oh, by the way, did you answer A? Did you read A and then answer A's questions and then read B and answer B's questions? Yeah. Good, good. I'm just going to commit Cardinal Sin number one and just read B. Uh, but that's what you should do. Nice. Okay. On the, okay. So. He sold his oboe. Oh my gosh. On the face of it, giving up an instrument you no longer use seems reasonable, but I was taken aback. Mark was not just a good, uh, an oboist. He was a great artist, but he couldn't do it alone. Him and his oboe did it together. Even in retirement, wouldn't Mark have some sort of a long lasting relationship? Like, you know, it's like uh, the Simpsons, you know, how uh, Maggie and not Maggie, uh, Lisa uses her saxophone. She loves her saxophone. And this guy is just selling. It. I don't know why. Wouldn't he want to keep it? Okay, here's my inference. I think that he believes the same thing that Luke does. Let's see. Uh, Joseph. Oh, never mind. It's a new person now. Rosman, is, I'm along for the ride. Distinguished violinist of Budapest, and he seems content to give up his beloved thing when he agreed to sell it to me after the quartet retired. But when I finally met up with him, he had second thoughts. He's like, Steinhardt, um, I'll sell you the violin to you uh, someday, but for now, I'm just enjoying the chamber music every Friday night. And that's what he did until his death. He died. He never sold it. And then these two people dealt with retirement in different ways. So Rosman keeps it, if she sells it. But their stories make me wonder not only what I'll do with my violin if I retire, but also the very nature of the musician's day-to-day -day -day relationship with this instrument. I began to play violin when I was six years old. Now I'm 76. Holy cow. Old dude. I'm going to stop reading this now. Just kidding. I, I, that was a horrible joke. All right. It's been an integral part of my life for the last seven decades. Uh, does that make my violin my very close friend? Well, yes. Sometimes the violin obviously can't speak words, but when I ask something of it, the instrument can respond with an astonishing range of substance and emotion. This friendship is the most exalted level. Man loves his, uh, his violin. There are many other things, however. When this violin suddenly refuses to do my bidding. Okay, so a <laughs> little bit of Harry Potter vibes here. When it reluctantly plays in tune and makes the sound that I want, delivers the music essence for us, I strive. Uh, then I have to cajole, bargain, and adjust its very whim. Some friend like adversary might say. Okay, so he says he has like a kind of like um, <laughs> a, a Voldemort Elder Wand sort of relationship with his violin. Um, yeah, if that makes sense to you, then, then great. Uh, so if the violin were my partner, a woman once uh, went backstage to congratulate the great violinist, this person, after the concert. What a wonderful sound your violin has, Mr. Heft. And then Mr. Heft looking down with the violin, opens the case and leans intently and says, funny, I don't hear a thing. My violin also lies mute in its case with me. But on the other hand, I stand mute in the concert stage without it. Ooh, drop that at the end. I like that. Basically saying I can't live without my my violin. Um I like this. I think this is well written and I have a tear in my eye. Uh, this is nice. So what's the first question you want to hit? Um, what's the first question you missed in this one? Uh, number, two. number two. I like you. I'm thinking I love this passage, but we'll see if I encoded anything. All right. So based on the passage assertion uh, A, that Luke's uh, attitude about how people treat a piano seems to be a mere philosophy in life, which the following statements would nearly disguise Luke's philosophy in life. Okay. So I'm actually, I know that he wants things to be played. I get that. And I, I, I'm going to try to answer this without going back. And I have the answer key to help me, but I'll, I'll look at it in a second. So um, F, it's better to live a full life and a perfect life than, than not participate because something might go wrong. This, okay, this is the right answer. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, this is this is correct. This one uh, screams at me as correct because he says that he likes it when even children play and hit wrong notes. He also says like he doesn't want it to be propped up on display. He wants people to play it. Okay, so F is definitely right. Let's look at 25, 26 just to double check yep see it literally talks about children in the next sentence okay so whenever you get these these sent these uh line passages go the sentence after and the sentence before that gives you some good context is that one fair does this one still seem hard uh, no oh but which one did you choose because sometimes it's hard to tease out why why others are wrong um this one i chose um what did you choose Oh, I G. Okay, G. Ooh, this is a tricky one. Life is a fragile gift that must be cherished. Our pianos that must be cherished and kept safe at all times. Opposite. Opposite. He, he he thinks it must be cherished, and you're like, oh yes, hundred percent. Remember one word, one suffix. You know, one little bit 
uh, that's wrong with it makes it all wrong. Like, and so it has to be perfect. I'm talking perfect. There has to be absolutely nothing wrong with it. No orange flags, no red flags. And here, it kept safe at all times. Does he agree with that? Kept safe at all times? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. He says those who preserve the piano as an altar, you know, who keep it safe. I, I imagine if you if you have it at nice in your home, then he says he doesn't like that. And then furthermore, he says the uh, depredations works on the children of keyboard. He regarded them as tolerable because why it's used. So it's not about being protected. You know, it's not about just being a priest of furniture. It's and he says if drinks are spilled on it, what happens? Hey, no biggie. That doesn't sound like somebody who says it needs to be protected at all costs. That sounds like somebody who's like, yeah, spill that Capri Sun on it. You know, life is meant to be lived. So yeah, um, here, what I could say is I love this. Everything that I've highlighted, I love it. So nice. A politician could say this, you know, this is this is clean. But then kept safe at all times. See, you're going in paths I can't follow. Okay, so make sure you discriminate um, between this first bit looks great, but then the next bit, oh, there's a worm in that in that cake. All right, uh, is that, what's the next question? Do you feel good about that, first of all? Yeah. Uh -huh. Sweet. What's next? Uh, the next one was three. Okay, as used in line 32, the phrase bit into most nearly means what? Oh my gosh, I do not remember this word. 32. Okay, it was more than just a piece of furniture. But it was that two the drinks were spilled and stains bit into the shiny fin. Okay, so it's like corroded or altered negatively. That's the word. So what I, on these types of questions, what you do is you go and you substitute out this word for your own word. Like I call it my Blake word, and my my Blake word was corroded or like damaged. Okay, so let's see, pinched, pinch the finish. No, you don't just pinch it. Oh, that's weird. I don't understand. I'm confused, so I'm not gonna choose it. I, I uh, when I say I'm confused, I'm actually like doubtful. That's correct. Ingested. Hmm. Ingested is when you like eat something or intake something. No. Marred. Yeah. Marred. Scar that thing. Mar it up. Right. That's that's corroding it. That's that's damaging it. Uh, D. Severing it. Ooh. No. That's like if you're cutting something off, off of something else. So marred is like damaged. So the answer is C. And I can verify this. It is C. Okay. Is that one easy now? Yeah. Okay. What's the next question? Um. Seven. Siete. Set. Passage five, a B. Oh, I said, what the heck? What's going on in my brain? Okay. The author most directly indicates that the violin is sometimes an adversary by stating that it what? Okay. An adversary. Um, basically, this is at the end. Do you remember where this this was? You should have a passage map to where this was. Hopefully. Um, here, he says, it's my whim. So right here near 80. There are moments when it refuses to do my bidding. It reluctantly plays a tune or makes a sound. I want to deliver the essence for such drive. Then I have to cajole, bargain, and adjust its whim. So basically, it has a mind of its own, right? And, and then he has to react. So lies mute in its case. That's not why. He's using it. B, makes him adjust his whims. Yes, that's true. C, responds with a range of emotion. Wow. I didn't see that. I didn't. Did you see that? I didn't see that description anywhere. D, can't speak with it with words. That's not why at all. <laughs> if anything, he's like making this thing speak with words, like figuratively. So no, C and D are bad. A is bad. Makes him adjust to his whims. Yeah. It even says that in 79, I have to cajole, bargain, and adjust to its every whim. Literally just says it. Hey, also, by the way, um, the ACT does page breaks in horrible spots on purpose, you know? Um, and so, so if you find an answer that's verbatim on the page line, personally, that's that's a good sign. <laughs> Uh, and that that might be too sauce or whatever, but uh, hey, my ACT teacher like eight years ago taught me that, and it it was true. So I don't know. It could be a conspiracy theory. Don't hold me to that one, but just could be. Okay, what's the next? Is that, is that one clear then? Seven. Yeah. Uh -huh. why, do, why do you think you missed that one? I'm curious. I saw range of emotion um, oh. in the paragraph before that, and it talked about friendship after that. So I thought. Okay. Hey, you're right. Okay. You're falling into a trap. So uh, let me tell you about this. My little brother, he went through this phase where he got 36, 35, 36, 35. And then he just went through a couple 27. And he was like, like, I do not understand. I thought I nailed that passage. Like I nailed it. I found an answer and I found evidence for every single question. I was like, okay, well, let's figure out what happened. And as I'm looking over his answer, yeah, he found an, he found, he found verbatim things, but he didn't ask them. He didn't ask himself for context. So like, he, for instance, in this case, where do you see range of emotion? Here it is, range of substance and emotion. Your job, so he would he would say, Blake, I found it. It's right there, line 72, duh. But I would say, no, 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 no. You did the first thing. It was just so good. You know, good job. You found you found the text. Context. It, you, you're you so close. You're so close. And, and the answers aren't super deep, but they are like deep enough that you need to have the context applied to the question stem. So I, I actually suspected this might be happening because it happened to my brother. Might be happening to you too. Um, maybe it's because I, I kind of maybe I overemphasized last time the kind of role of evidence and evidence is beautiful. It's just that you have to screen it by the context. Like the context has to make sense. And so here he's like talking about how 
I can't think of anything, but it responds like awesome. But then, but that's not what we're talking about in the question system. Question system is talking about the antagonist. You know, it's, it's talking about when it's not cooperating, when it's an adversary, not when it's at its best, you know? Uh -huh. And so, yes, this is a, th this is in the text, but that's not enough. We, we got to go just one. And, and it's not like a huge step further. It's just the context has to be there. Okay. So what I would tell my brother is I would say, find the evidence, get the context. If it lines up, choose it immediately, move on. Uh, don't fall into the trap of just seeing the, the phrase, you know, control F and then selecting it if it exists, because I guarantee you, they're going to throw in traps like that. Uh -huh. Okay, I think that was good. I think that, I think that's a good tip for you to know. Okay, what's next? Any uh, until ten again? Yeah, there was nine. Till there was you. In contrast, the way pianos are described in passage A, passage B's author violin. Oh, the author's violin and B is described as what? So he loves his his bud. Um, I don't know. I, I actually so usually when I before I answer the questions, I like to have like an answer ready off on my tongue because that usually means that I, I thought about it properly this is a little bit one of like i'm going to tell you four things and you're gonna tell me which one is right so let's see exhibiting unique characteristics wow so specific no 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 okay so this is wrong because passage a thinks that they have unique characteristics as well right he's like hey the humidity the history he loves that stuff passage b might agree with this as well but in contrast so a is wrong b having an active personality of its own so b yes b 100 sure yeah <clears throat> a a is more like, hey, I have a lot of pianos that come into my store. I do my best to understand their history. I like it when people use them. I didn't see anything about having an active personality on its own. So I'm going to probably go with B as a soft, probably yes. C, sustaining damage from careless children. No, that's A's thing. Uh, and plus, yeah, that, that that's backward. D, being important to daily life. <laughs> no, no, no. They both think it's important to daily life, silly goose. Oh, D, you tried. You tried as a question. You tried as an answer. Okay, B. And uh, nine is indeed B. Okay. All right. Are these still hard? No, not really. And furthermore, do they do they seem like maybe there's something you can just correct here in the next passage read, or do you feel like it's just a toss up? Um, <laughs> okay, you I, feel, you're valid either way. I think it's like not falling into the trap of just like assuming that it's right because it's word for word, um, and then just like not thinking too much. Yeah, not thinking too much, not falling into the trap, and then encoding and stuff. And honestly, you're like naturally just a good reader. So as long as you fix that little like trap thing, you should be doing great. Um, uh -huh. cool. uh, did you miss 10 or, or is that one all good to go? I also missed 10, yeah. Okay, let's do 10. Which of the following assertions about instruments is most strongly supported by details provided in both A and B? So basically, I can't formulate something on my tongue. I just have to read them. Okay, so familiarity with instruments is an important part of the job of playing music. <sighs> details though like is that a true statement yes did they both agree with it let me think of a detail for it for me each familiarity with your instrument is important to the joy of playing music did you talk about how great musicians have um serious musicians who use and depend on their instruments for livelihood it seems like that is true and it seems like he does give examples if it's at the heart of the family with this with the stains on it and you have to interact with your so maybe i would say like the stains on the piano um the way that they ship it and serious musicians, that's not a detail. So I'd say those two, there are two details that I could maybe pass for A. And then definitely B has tons of details about why that's correct. I mean, he he details life of two people. It's like, I'm when I was reading that, it was like, have you seen the movie Soul? Yeah. I felt kind of like that. Like, maybe, I can't remember what happens, but you know, like he's a musician and stuff. And he loves his music. It was like a beautiful little Pixar short film in my head. So I think F is good. It's got enough examples for B. A arguably has enough examples, but we'll see. Fortunately, I have the answer key, so I know it's F now. <laughs> so that helps. And then let's, let's look at G though. Instruments should be revered and never treated like furniture. A agrees with that. But remember the first person who sold his, his oboe? He just, hmm. I don't think B is actually making those claims. I, I could see that B might agree with it, but I don't see details supporting it. That's a big difference. And so here I'd highlight the word details and I would, because I highlighted details, I would say G's wrong. H, selling your instrument shows disrespect for the music you played altogether. Come on, we're, we're past this. You know, A sells his uh, instruments, it's fine. B sells, they're great people, sell them, it's fine. J, maintain pr uh, proper humidity levels is essential. For that. Okay, A agrees with this, but B doesn't. There are no details in B. So G has, de G has details, oh, in, in A, and so does this one in A, and this one in B, but none of them have in both, except for F. Uh-huh, okay. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Um, is there another one you want to go over? Or do you think that our kind of, you know, smoothing out these re reading comprehension wrinkles is going to be sufficient kind of prep here for this section? Or would you like to go over another passage? Um, could also do this one, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. 
I'm, I'm all about just whatever is the most helpful. And so I think we should definitely do this one here too. Okay, so this is uh, Notes for a Wedding. I'm excited for this. Not yet. Let me just, okay. Yeah, I love Notes for a Wedding. Here we go. <laughs> so it was never Kenny Holmes' intention to become a wedding singer. The grandson of this West Indian immigrants, Holmes was raised in Gordon Heights, Long Island. And he calls it a small black community with like-minded thinkers, so homogenous families of immigrants and Southern blacks who, as Holmes says, didn't come out here to fool around um, and who handed down their children their own keen sense of ambition. Okay, so basically maybe they're immigrants not fooling around, trying to make their place in the world. Um, okay, he's in Long Island. Cool. We grew up thinking, uh, we grew up in that kind of atmosphere, positive thinking, getting educated, whether or not you had to agree. Okay, so like, awesome. Uh, connections, I think of Malcolm Gladwell, you know, was the book about outliers how like all the sons and daughters of immigrants are doctors because they have a good work ethic so try to draw connections it really helps your brain kind of remember things okay like an american boy and this and this he was fascinated with popular music okay he listened to frank sinatra um in the evenings the coat hanger stuck on the radio and he put the faint signal on the blue station would come and as a teenager his brother brought him a guitar 16 um, it was sat, it was Sunday night and I sat down and played. I can't get no satisfaction. I was addicted. So introduction to music. Uh, next, while he wasn't like a natural talent, he did discover that he he could make some monies. Got some. Um, he learned these things, these songs here. And so I, I would highlight these as details. Formed a band and he went out and he would play three songs a night, get pretty popular. And hey, 10 bucks a night. Rent out some stuff. So he makes money. Still a career in a musician. Musician was not what he and his family had in mind. Over the next couple of years, he said, hey, I did everything I could not to be a guitar player. I even went to college. I even did all this stuff. Think I'd be a psychiatrist. Took pre-med classes. <laughs> Maybe there's going to be you. Hey, I don't know if you have any desire to go play the uh, play some Beatles covers for the rest of your life. You might want to look into that. <laughs> all right. Along the way, he continued playing nightclubs and parties. In mid-20s, then he goes to Washington. And Washington, look, uh, to home is like a good place, an ambitious, career-minded uh, for a black man. But it had a thriving music scene in nightclubs and hotel lounges. The next 15 years played out as a sort of tussle between the creative pursuits and a more business-driven impulses. Okay, so he's got this like battle inside of him. I tried really hard not to be a guitar. I think he's going to end up being a guitar dude. So he works his way in the music scene, plays a bunch of gigs, writes some music, starts a recording studio called Sound Ideas. Actually, oh my gosh. I'll tell you about that in a second. Which trawled local talent for making a mix of a hit song, but he found the picking slim. Sound ideas. I think I've actually heard about this in another ACT English test. In, in the, you know, the passages where they talked about how they had like a huge conglomeration of people, local artists come in. Do you remember that one too? I don't know. I think so. Yeah, maybe so. Uh, I think, I really think it's the same one. I don't know. Club scene after a while. Who knows? The begin to wear on him, um, unwilling to resign himself to a life of business. Let me see. Oh, starving artist. Okay, opposite. When the agent approaches him in the 90s, specialized wedding in private homes, he decided to try it. He's like, okay, fine. Uh, okay. It was a revelation. I can make uh, in one night what I used to make in five, and it changed the culture of what I was doing. Okay, so basically weddings? Is that what it is? Yeah. So if Holmes finds weddings, and he's like, yo, I made it. Holmes is well suited for the role of a band leader. His production skills help him control the band, the familiarity with all the types of music. It was perfect. Tango for the waltz. Okay, because uh, business ebbs and flows, so it changes with seasons. Holmes always kept a variety of sidelines, like a job for limousine, putting his oldest daughter to put his oldest daughter through school. These days at gigs, he hands out stacks of million dollar bills printed with his image. Oh, dang. And his current enterprise is band leader, commercial mortgage banker, and hard money lender. Dang, that's awesome. Holmes uh, uses as many as eight musicians and two singers for weddings. He accepts turnover as a factor of running the band, so maybe business out of it. And uh, the current core lineup has, in the mercurial world, so that means like fast changing, worlds of part-time performers been fairly steady. Sam, the drummer, Atiba, the sax, have played with him three or four years respectively, and also Bruce, the boardist, has played with him for 15. So... So basically he has, he has his, his go-tos. This is uh, perhaps because Holmes exists on making music. During performances, he lets his musicians take the lead and he uses specialized stripped down tech tracks called digital sequences to set the tempo and musical parts. So he uses the tech, referring the messy alchemy of live music uh, to something more canned. Oh, wait, he doesn't use the tech? Hold on. No, no, he doesn't. Wait, he lets them take the lead. Oh, and he just uses digital sequences. Okay, so it's like a way to kind of let them show their own expression. Okay, the musician said that this is contrast to band leaders they work for who often rely on heavily recordings uh, heavily on recordings and use musicians more as visual props. He doesn't do that. Holmes respects these people. And he says these guys play from the hearts and not trying to get through the gig. Sweet. Okay. Um, so the way that I look at this one is we got this guy coming into Long Island and it's like, he's got these expectations to be a doctor. He tries to be a doctor. He does everything he possibly can to uh, fight the urge to be a musician, but he's hooked on it. He's addicted to it. He starts playing for 10 bucks a night. He starts working. He's really struggling. He moves to Washington. think it's going to be a good scene for him. You know, and he decides, you know what? I'm just going to do this. Somebody approaches him about wedding, private stuff. And he's like, all right, I'm going to make a lot of money. He makes a lot of money in one night. He's like, I can do this. Makes a business out of it. Now he has his own little like club and he's got his people that play with him and he's living the life. Hey, let's see if, uh, let's see if we're ready to tackle this. What uh, question would you like to hit? Uh, number 12. Numero 12. One theme of the passage is what? Okay. 
We just got to go through each one. One's previous experience and pursuits can be useful in achieving success. Uh, okay. Yeah. His previous experience and pursuit was with doing cover, ba- uh, cover recordings for like some songs he liked into like being a business manager for, uh, weddings and, and private venue. So yes, F is correct. I like that. G talents is the most important factor. No. He said he wasn't talented. Do you remember that part? He wasn't a natural talent. It was like in paragraph two or something. Okay. So that's why G's wrong. H, recognizing one's limitations is necessary in overcoming one's failures. What limitation did he recognize? I don't think he did. He just kind of followed his dreams. So H is a nice sob story, and it seems like I might be right, but not in this passage. I don't see any, any evidence supporting it. J, pursuing one's dreams should take precedence over practical matters. Ooh. Well, okay. This is a tempting, tempting one. But there's no... I, I, I would choose this one if at the end they said that. However, I would have to be assuming to choose J. Like there was no actual literal statement that said you should do what I did and not make it work. I, I didn't see anything like that, but I could see how people would want to insert and project that onto the story. So uh, the biggest thing I'd say is just don't don't assume anything. And I don't think you'll choose Jay. It's a tough one though. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of, I'd feel more inclined to sink my teeth into that one too. If, uh, if I saw an evidence for it and if I didn't have the answer key literally pulled up in front of me. <laughs> so uh, the answer is F. Cool. Yeah. All right. What's the next one? Uh, 13. 13. Which of the following events uh, referred to in the passage occurred last chronologically? Okay. Should be simple. Um, home starts sound ideas. Wasn't that earlier? That was earlier. Starts driving a limo. Oh, geez. I don't even remember that. Bronner Jones joins the band. Taylor joins the band. Okay. Yikes. <laughs> Bronner. Okay. Here's Bronner. Here's Taylor. Three or four years. Oh, oh, look at that. So Bronner joined three years ago. Taylor joined four years ago. Wait, mm. this is confusing um re- last chronologically so that means like the most recent one so who joined the band last let's see um where they go again Bronner and and Atiba played with him for three so Sam Bronner joins later than Ta- Atiba did Bronner's later than Atiba okay so Bronner joins after Atiba so Taylor can't be right Bronner has to be better than Taylor that's confusing <laughs> that was hard uh so B is looking good home starts driving a limo it wasn't that earlier uh, well, that was earlier on right all this stuff happens way later so I think B is is correct. Um, and thirteen is is B indeed. Hey, is that good? Yeah. Uh-huh. Nice. What's the next uh one you want to hit? Uh, nine. Uh, nineteen. Yeah. Okay, nineteen. It can be most reasonably uh, inferred from the passage that Holmes band members like playing music with Holmes in part because, in contrast to other band leaders, Holmes does what? Maybe it's because he lets them play. Yeah, I think that that's why I think it is. Now let's look at the answer. Is famous for big bands. What? Is he? Even if he is, that's not why they like it. There was a whole paragraph talking about how they liked that they let him play. B allows them to showcase their talents. Yeah, he lets them play. B is good. C played music at Washington club scene for 15 years. <laughs> That's not why they like him. And plus that was only one person, right? Um, that was like his oldest band member. And maybe, yeah, maybe that would, that coincided with the start of it. But yeah, C is kind of like just unrelated a little bit. D use sophisticated elements like digital sequences. He does do that. Hey, you're yes. Did you choose D? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you did the thing where you just saw, you saw the, the phrase and you're like, yes. I got it right. <laughs> but uh, you got to use the context here. Yes, indeed, they, they did use digital sequences. This is this is true. But you don't get a cookie just for that. You get, it's a little bit a little bit harder. You got to you gotta do more than that. So here it says um, they liked it because they got to express themselves. They didn't like it because of the digital sequence. OK, I, I think that. Yeah, I think I think it was just a little bit too like verbatim. And honestly, that, that might that's partially on me. Because I think last time I overemphasized the role of evidence because evidence is super important, but you need that context to to use it properly. Yeah. Okay. Um, feeling? Do you feel better about the reading here a little bit? I hope. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So, do you want to hit another passage, or would you like to do um, another section? Um, I think we could just do another passage. Okay, let's do another passage. Which one? The just the just the one right after this? Yeah, the one right after. I also missed a lot on. Okay, sweet. Here we go. Photographs changes how cultural groups represents and perceived. Oh, sweet. This isn't the, the the first time I've seen this passage, by the way. They like this one, apparently. Like, literally, there's another with, with a similar idea. Um, let's just dive in this. So, Muskogee Nation of Oklahoma. All right. So, how do photographs affect how people are perceived? Photographs as educational resources uh, present some challenges. So, it, it, maybe it, it can be tough. We got to watch how we do it. There's more than a face to a photo. And so, the American Indians are no exception. Rise in the 19th century with the change in the American Indian community is the era caps in 300 years of diseases, war, and all this stuff. So, basically, subjugated population. Indian people struggled to uh, adapt to these changes in the old way of living. And the photographers took, adv- took pictures and probably advantage of them. And what they believed were the natural ethno- ethnographic images of the vanishing Indian. Okay. So, People who documented the subjugation of the Indian people and their assimilation afterwards. As uh, the culture is bent under the pressure to assimilate in the mainstream, 
they 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 would routinely capture images of the new civilized Indian. Yeah, they dress them up in like suits and stuff like that. Any delegations that traveled to Washington D.C. to defend the tribal treaty were photographed in studios in front of the federal buildings. Photogra- uh, photographers also accompanied the government expeditions in the West, where they documented the traditional cultures, leading way for tourists and other people to come. Carrying cameras, misconceptions of Native American communities. These efforts were uh, generated a legacy of photographic images of the American Indian people that can serve today as rich educational resources, but also, if curiously, they can actually have this field romanticized and stereotypical perceptions of the American Indians. I have an amazing anecdote. Have you ever been to the Museum of... Uh, have you been to the Smithsonian of American History? Where is that at? It's in uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah, then I do. Yeah, there's a whole exhibit on like how Indian American Indians are portrayed in popular culture and how Pocahontas is seen as like the epitome of beauty and how like the Battle of Bill's Run or whatever, or whatever it was. The Indians beat like you know, the Americans. Yeah, They destroyed the, the American people. And yet the American people herald that event as like, yeah, they defended themselves. right? And then you have all these photos of these Indian chiefs wearing suit coats. Like, this is so true. Like, what, what, this passage is, like, right on. Um, it, it totally happens. And people tried to change the narrative, I guess. Anyways. Um, anyways, it's just, I think it's just a fascinating subject. They have, like, a whole gallery full of, like, brand names and, and how people romanticize the Indians and things like that. Okay. A little, a little fun aside there. You can have a little fun here. All right, so consider some of the photographs in this place. The Apache man and musicians named Geronimo. All right, he and other, these Apaches fought and protracted the protracted that means like elongated war from 1863 to this time so wow it's a long war um 23 years against the united states for the right to live in the traditional homelands the dreaded reservations apparently these apaches fight for freedom um captures this imagination here Geron- geronimo especially is this legendary figure yeah kind of like they did in the battle of bill run he is the courage daring savage savage ruthlessness world war ii paratroopers shouted his name yeah the uh, movies televisions and even baseball teams right uh bear his image and name one photo shows him and three other people in the camp just prior to surrendering forces and documents critical and a uh, difficult day for the people who had fought so diligently in their freedom. Okay. So basically, just like I talked about with the Battle of Bill Run, another uh, was the studio portrait Go Go Yafle. Go Go Flay poses with a rifle. I've never heard of him. To this century, Geronimo faces a, a dangerous enemy. At the same time, the curious of the Wild West. Okay, so Wild West is coming up. This photo personifies the renegade image, the old image. Strangely, it was taken out of two or four years when he surrendered. Then while he was a prisoner of war, then why then was his photo taken? What's the meaning of it? Um, you know, what does it convey about his mind? What does it mean today? It's loaded with historical truth, but it's empty. Or is it as empty as the prisoner's bullet chamber? Okay, so this is like posing an example of how you can't be too sure about like how the photo alters the perception. A few years later, uh, Goya Flay. Who's Goya Flay? I'm sorry. He, oh, he's a Chiri Chihuahua. So he's an Indian, American Indian person. Okay. Sorry, I just lost track of that. So the meaning behind this is the people see the photo personify the government's policy. Okay. Um, so doing feared hatred, re-educating them. Yeah. A better way forward. Ironically, the Apaches had long farmed out the traditional life. They fought substantially. So here it's like, once again, the controlling of the image of how these people are portrayed. Next, the educational potential of photogra- photographs is enormous. The photographs are not objective. They can easily tell as many truths and lies, as many writing documents. They can be read and understood to understand, uh, understood accurately in a biased and non-stereotypical terms. Every photo contains its history, culture, and context. This is huge. This, I think, is like the main idea of the passage. To do justice to the subjects and the stories, it's crucial to fill the information in the gaps. In addition to conducting background research, trying to put yourself in their shoes, sitting next to, to the Goya Flay, his peers, his wife, and the children, is important. You might begin to understand the world through their points of view, frame the factual information, and viewed it empathetically. Each photograph uh, can reach its highest potential and significant educational opportunity resource. So basically, he says, only by understanding the context, the social context, and the social substrate can we make sense and uh, fruitfully, efficiently use these photos? So cool. What's the first uh, question? Um, 23. All right, 23. Which of the following words most nearly given a neg- negative connotation in this one? Romanticized is what I think. Because when they use romanticized, they're actually trying to say like the Indian people were romanticized, but it, not in a good way, in a hyperbolized way, if you remember that. So um, that, that one seems right. Although we could just look through each one. Oh, educational resources. That's great. So one is fine. Old. Line 10. They're just talking about, no, n- nothing derogatory about that. It's just their old style of living. Romanticized, we talked about that. Traditional 34. No, no, they're just referring to the homelands. That modifies homelands. And that's not that's not controversial at all. Um, you know, like the adjective traditional homelands, it's not said in like a disparaging way. What is said disparaging is like how they romanticized the plight of the Indians. That's kind of messed up. Mm-hmm. Okay. That one's tough though. Hey, if you're not looking for it, it can be tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. What's the next one? Uh, 24. Okay, 24. Which of the following referred to the passage most clearly uh, characterize the hypothetical events rather than actual events? Jeez. 
these are time consuming um hypothetical rather than actual wasn't that over here wait let me see Okay, hypothetical events. So basically, which one isn't real? <laughs> Let's figure it out. Traveled to 17. Is this real? Yeah, they literally traveled to Washington, D.C. That's that. That's real. That's literal. Uh, B, G, defend, line 18. Were they actually defending? Let's see. Yeah, yeah. They literally were defending the treaty rates. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. 72, farmed? Farmed? Were they literally farming? Let's see. Farmed as part of the traditional life they fought to protect. Yeah, yeah. They're talking about teaching to farm literally, as you can see in 71. So that's literal as well. Okay, so this better be right. J, stand next to 83. Oh, yeah. Put yourself in the photo. You know, only Blue's Clues can do that. You know, that's that's hypothetical. You can't actually stand next to them in the photo. Oh, I got this one right, but I marked it wrong. Hey, let's go. Oh, let me double check the answer, though. Yep, it's 24 is J. Okay, yeah. Good. What's the next uh, question? Um, 27. Okay, 27. In the past, as the author knows, that a strange aspect of the photo of Goya Flay with a rifle is that the photo was taken where? Wasn't like controversial, like maybe I granted you saw that I kind of I kind of faltered here when I was reading this with Goya Flay. I think this is like talking about this bit right here. So just prior to surrendering their forces, it was a difficult day when they fought. So what is strange about that? Photo with a rifle is taken when? Oh, here this one. He poses with a rifle in 19, 1890, but the problem is he was taken as a prisoner of war here. So why is he posing with a rifle afterwards? Wait, hold on. Personifies this strangely to come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The photo per personifies the renegade image strangely. Here's the word strangely. And why is it strange? It was taken about two or four years after he surrendered while he was taken prisoner. So why is this photo taken? So that's the strange bit. So it's taken when he's a prisoner of war. That's why it's weird. And you know that because you look at the word strangely and then you look around for context. Oh, okay. Okay. 28. Or wh what was the next one? Uh, 29. 29. The author indicates that for the sake of unbiased interpretation, compared to reading written documents with care, reading photographs with care is what? Significantly more important? Slightly more? Oh gosh. Slightly less or just as? Okay, this one we just have to find what he says. Every photo to do justice. Do you see any comparison here? Um... Oh, here it is. Found it. As much as any writing docu written document, they have to be read with care in order to be understood. In a stereotypical term. So he's comparing it to writing documents here. But is there more? Is there more like explicit statement about how they're the same? Because I think here, here he's saying like they're very similar. Because he says as much as a written document. If I can't find anything quickly, then I think I'd use it as my evidence. It'd have to be over here or the end, I think. So he obviously esteems him highly. And I think, yeah, putting yourself in these photos. So here again, he's saying in addition to conducting background research, also look at the photos framed with factual information. So he's comparing it with it. He's saying like with the factual information, just as factual information is important, this is also important. So I'm going to say just equally as. The last paragraph seems to indicate that. So just just equally as important. So 29C. Okay. All right. Um, did you find any evidence that says the contrary? Because I think I think we just have to go with the preponderance of evidence on this one. And uh, the last paragraph seems to be making the case that it's like, just like you would look at historical documents, you should also look at photos, which implies that he's not prioritizing one or the other. He's saying just as or as the same. Yeah. So C. Yeah. Hey, um, is that all for this one? Yeah. Nice. Nice. Should we do the next little bit too, the next passage, or do you want to go to a different section? Uh, I guess for the next passage, we could just go over the questions. Yeah, let's just do the questions. Sweet. So what do we got here? What's the first question? Uh, 38. 38. As used in 26, the word extent. So the word extent usually means the remaining remaining text, like the extant text. But let's see, 26. So we take out the word extent, we read around it and say what it says. So however, when the sepals are, sepals are sufficiently wetted, the tension increase to such an extent oh they're not like extant they're saying like to such a degree like if they are the tension is increased to such a degree that like the mechanism snaps so degree is kind of like my word oh so g yeah so hey the the technique here is you always take out that word and fill it in with your own word you know i fill it in with my own blake word which happened to be a great degree and then i say which one's closest and it turns out it was the same word so that's how you do those questions were there any more on this one yeah there was 39 39 which the following actions did the people of the navag desert take in order to farm there what did the navag people do all right let's do this where they talk about the navag navag people and what they did navag mm -hmm. people right here 35 the solution is runoff farming and what is runoff farming the master harnessing flash floods catching the runoffs by making terraces and building large taverns. Oh, sister. So what the Navig people do? They built terraces and they built large cisterns. So the answer is constructing terraces. Okay. All right. Did you miss 40? No. Cool, cool. Um, How are you feeling about the reading session now? I think a lot better. Good. Hey, I'm glad. I'm glad. Every, you got to get it out of your system. You got to shake it off. Because <laughs> every, everything else is going pretty well.
Um, is there another, which section would you like to go over now? Um, Math or science or any English? Um, we go over some of the science. Yeah, I think that that's the best move is definitely the science. Um, Because I think that was the next lowest score. So what's the first question? Um, The first one was number of. Don't. Suppose a researcher observed wind speeds greater than 80. I need to move the rock. It's consistent with who? So where do they talk about 80 in the rocks? So speed for rocks. Let's see. Speed for the rock. Um, do we say anything about speed? Buoyancy, evidence, due to combinations. I don't see anything. Snow melting, temperature, doesn't get enough ice, wet, dormant, grow rapidly, presence of mud. Oh, here it is. Relatively strong winds are required. Hey, hey, hey. Is 80 a strong wind? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a strong wind. So two. So it's the either. It's so and it wasn't in one. I didn't see anywhere in one because one says light winds, right? So since it's not one, but it is two, then it means it has to be H. But let's double check that by looking at three. So it has to be three. Look at that. Three says strong winds. Boom. Done. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Nice. So hey, these ones are always the same. I always say like take general notes if you want to. You, you can, and that's fine. But also, what I would say is like just get the sound bites. You know you know that they're all going to be saying their own take on each each item. You know, if you wanted to, you can make a graph. You can make like a chart of these if you wanted to. Don't actually do this, but to get to get the idea here, wind, nah, check, check. And you can literally just look out for these things. You know, ice rafts, nah, check. You know, so you can just go through like that. Uh -huh. Okay. Hey, what's the next one? The next one was 26. Did you say 26? Yeah. Okay, nice. All the way down here. So at uh, one atmosphere of pressure, the melting point of ammonia, is 77 so it's pretty low and the boiling point is and the boiling point is a little higher based on this info and description of the apparatus when the ammonia exits the condenser is it solid or liquid okay so if it's if it's exiting the condenser what do condensers do uh, um so condensers usually you, if you're condensing you're, you're condensing a vapor like a gas into a liquid but let's say we don't know that let's just find our temperature and let's uh transfer it over so let's see um so 26 we have to find what the temperature would be for ammonia in the as it exits the condenser so hopefully they have some graph about that where's my condenser where'd it go condenser do i have a temperature anywhere minus 50 mixture of ammonia unreacts flow through pipe set of a negative 50 condenser okay so it's a, I think it's a negative 50 then, right? So let's scroll down. Negative 50, where would that be? So if it's negative 50, then it's melted. If it's melted, then it's liquid. And has it frozen, has it boiled yet into a vapor? No. So it's in between liquid and vapor. So it's a liquid. And why? Because it's in between. Negative 50 is in between these two values, which means it's vapor. Not, sorry, which means it's liquid. So the answer is J. <clears throat> what was the curve on this one? Did they allow for one mistake? I don't know. Oh yeah, they did. They allowed for two mistakes for a 36. That's really irregular. Usually it's like one mistake and you can't get a 35 anymore. So you, you could have missed that one and another one and still got a 36. Oh, all right, what's the next question? Um, 30. 30. All right, we'll try to end on this one here. End on a high note. Okay, 30. This one says, for the range of temperatures, range of humidities, shown in figures one and two, alpha is hertz is most strongly affected by change of temperatures and changes of relative humidity. So what affects it more? Okay, this one we should be able to do pretty simply here. So range of temperatures, I shown in figures one and two, alpha for a 200 sound is most strongly affected by what? Let's see if we can just solve this. One, two. Alpha 200, alpha 200. So here's this uh, kind of like Morse code frequency here at the bottom. And here it's also at the bottom. And it looks like what's most affected here we have alpha and here we have alpha. Is it more affected by humidity or temperature? This one pops up to three and then it goes down. This one stays pretty constant around uh, one the whole time. This one goes three and it goes down and it goes up again. So temperature looks like it's pretty volatile. Would you agree with that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go with temperature, so F and G, cool. Now, because the maximum variation is about this and the maximum variation is about this, well, figure one is the one that measures uh, temperature. And so if this is lower than the decimal range here, then it would make sense. So F doesn't make sense, right? Because the one that has the greater amplitude would be the one that affects it more. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I'm going to go with G then. So, and uh, let me confirm real quick, real quickly. Sorry, because confirm is a verb. Quickly is the adverb. Yeah, G for 30. Indeed. Okay. Hey, and that's, uh, that's all she wrote. Mm -hmm.